We have a very good panel here today. I'm very pleased. Uh, as Ambassador Mark Ginsburg, who I think everybody in Washington knows, was one of the, uh, he was the first United States uh, ambassador to an Arab country of Jewish religion. He uh, acquitted himself very well in Morocco, has shown himself to be a great friend of the Moroccan people, and everybody in Washington admires and respects his opinion. Uh, Dr. Jutta, it's Jutta, Jutta Clausen from Brandeis, who uh, is a very distinguished academic in the field of Islam, is, uh, Islamic studies, but is a professor of comparative politics. And then we have my dear friend and uh, my imam, so to speak, Mirza Effendi Amesic. Uh, uh, Mirza is uh, imam of the Zagreb Mosque, and uh, Muslims are a, are a minority in Croatia, as he will tell you, but the Zagreb Mosque is a very distinguished institution in the history of Islam in the Balkans, also a very beautiful institution. And uh, so I think that uh, this is a terrific panel, and I'm very pleased to preside over it. And I will preside with a firm hand, and uh, we'll give everybody about 10 to 12 minutes. How's that? Does that sound right? 12, and for, we'll give you 15. through 15, since you've come such a long way. So I'm going to ask the first speaker to uh, be Dr. Jutta Clausen, Associate Professor of Comparative Politics at Brandeis University. And our, our topic is Ideology and Theology in European Societies. Um, I just want to start out by thanking um, our hosts, Stephen Swartz, for getting us all started here and, and have this opportunity um, to talk about what is uh, really an important issue. Um, it um, I started um, about uh, four years ago, um, a project based on interviewing um, Muslim uh, civic and political leaders in Western Europe. And when I started my project, I thought that the headscarf conflicts were over. <laughs> and I thought that, in fact, we, had, uh, we were now in the recovery phase and um, the whole issue about uh, Islam and the accommodation of Muslims would move into politics as usual um, and how wrong I was. <laughs> um, the, I want to address the question about theology and um, ideology um, at, at, um, today. And uh, I, Muslims understandably feel that their faith should not be held responsible uh, for terrorism. Um, but jihadism has uh, raised some very large questions about the relationship uh, between religion and, uh, and politics. Um, when you look at the European debates, uh, there are different opinions about uh, where uh, does um, Islamist terrorism come from. There's a sense among uh, many security uh, people that, in fact, it's an international movement and uh, that the folks who crop up here and there engaged in terrorism in Europe are uh, recruits who have found uh, Islam uh, late in life. Uh, this actually is a pretty much a statistical fact, um, and that uh, they have more in common with earlier generations of terrorists than they have, um, like the Rode Armee Fraktion or Bader Meinhof, the IRA or other groups, um, than they have um, with uh, what really are the issues um, related to the integration of Islam in general. Um, then there are people who think that um, Islam is in some measure at fault. And um, one of the things that I think it is important to recognize is that um, we have, it's a common to say in the United States that there are 10 times as many uh, people arrested in Europe on terrorism charges as there are in, in the US. Um, there are also 10 times as many Muslims in Europe as there are in, in, in the United States. And I think that the uh, latest uh, North American plot suggests that um, it is probably not true that uh, Europe is in any particular way responsible for breeding terrorism. Um, <coughs> most of uh, uh, the recruits for al Sakawi in um, operations in, in uh, Iraq have not been Europeans, although there was the woman, a Belgian woman, a convert, uh, who offered herself up. Uh, but um, 
most of the recruits have really come from uh, the um, Islamic states, and uh, um, they, it is uh, not clear to what extent uh, general alienation and anger at the conditions Muslims um, are faced with in Europe really is responsible for uh, the rise of terrorism. I think ultimately it's more interesting to address a much harder question about um, what does Europe need to do in order to come to terms with Islam, and what do Muslims need to do? Um, when, um, in the aftermath of the July bombings, um, it was interesting to watch um, the reaction in, among British Muslims. Uh, Mohammed Nassim, uh, who um, was a candidate for the Respect Party in the parliamentary elections, and uh, the chairman of the trustees uh, for the Birmingham Central Mosque uh, took the opportunity when the police uh, had a press conference after it was revealed that the July 21 bombers, um, the 21st bombers were from Birmingham, to stand up and say that he thought that um, the 9-11 attacks on Washington, D.C. and New York were planned by the CIA to m make Muslims look bad. And he went on to say that um, Muslims all over the world have never heard of an organization called Al-Qaeda. Um, this was an example of the kind of denial uh, turning into um, apologia that um, you do hear occasionally. There were all the same voices. Um, immediately when he said this, uh, the uh, Khalid Mahmoud, a Labour MP elected in Birmingham, stood up and called for uh, Mr. Nassim's uh, resignation and said the man has his head in the sand, he's saying black is white, etc. A more common and perhaps more difficult way of, of addressing um, the, the relationship within Islam to the terrorists is um, um, a reaction by Imam Abdul Jal Saeed, um, who is a um, prominent British Imam, has been in charge of interfaith dialogue for the Regent Park Mosque, who argues that it should be forbidden to describe the terrorists as Islamic. Uh, and in fact, this is a strategy that the EU recently has taken in a new set of guidelines that were just issued for how the press should deal with uh, issues related to Muslims and, and Islam. Um, he, Imam Said, um, who argues that what the terrorists are doing is against the Quran, the term Muslim perhaps could be used, but the term Islam certainly, uh, they are outside the faith, they're opposites, he says. Um, and uh, I think when we think about it, um, it, it, it this kind of... Uh, automatic response really doesn't work. Uh, the reality is that there are serious public policy issues that we have to come <coughs> to terms with, and we need to have a debate about um, theology and the compatibility with um, modern values. Now, in Europe, this debate um, t is, is often wrapped up in a general worry about a new alliance between all folks religious, Catholics, um, American-style evangelicals and Muslims, who increasingly are voicing common um, complaints about um, bioethics. Um, for instance, in Britain, uh, the Muslim Council of uh, Britain joined up together with the Anglican Church and the Roman Catholic Church to prevent an amendment to abortion law uh, that would, uh, no, to, adapt, uh, to adoption law that would allow um, same-sex couples to um, uh, have um, uh, ad uh, to adopt children. Uh, and these are the issues that often come up. Uh, in reality, there are serious issues in, in Europe about what, how Europeans should learn to live with religious people. Um, Europe does not have a First Amendment tradition, um, and currently, as many of you know, um, it is standard practice in Europe to maintain lists of banned sects, which include uh, many religious groups that are, are, are you know, quite uh, uh, active in the United States, including Scientology. Um, but it also goes much further than that. Uh, the uh, and, most clergy, uh, Roman Catholic or Protestant, um, are educated at public universities. Um, the, in most European countries, the salaries of clergy are paid 
uh, via tax money in one way or another. Um, as in Germany, the federal government collects uh, a church tax that it then redistributes to the faith, um, to the Protestant, to the uh, Roman Catholic, as well as to the Jewish communities, but uh, not for Islam. And um, I think it's very important to recognize that when we speak about the issues about integration of Islam and the, mani the, the development of uh, various types of uh, interpretations of Islam, some of which are anti-democratic, we need to get um, the general picture of what does it mean to build a new faith in Europe. In a very short time span, Islam has become Europe's second largest religion, and there is absolutely no infrastructure supporting the development and the institutionalization of Islam. To some extent, um, the fact that Islam is Europe's first congregational faith in the sense that it is the mosque councils and the mosque communities themselves that are responsible for building uh, the mosques, uh, for, for supervision, and for the hiring and um, employment conditions of um, imams um, is a gift. Uh, and we should learn to recognize that it is a gift because Islam is now being developed in Europe outside uh, the control of authoritarian clerical elites and uh, authoritarian Islamic states. This is what Tariq Ramadan speaks about when he talks about European Islam as um, a new movement, uh, a source of revival within Islam. Um, an opportunity to rid Islam of the various kinds of, um, some, he uses the word, impurities that have come from the involvement of authoritarian uh, elites. Nonetheless, it is important also to recognize that this movement takes place in people's private homes and private communities, not in the universities, not with any assistance from the universities, and often against great opposition from uh, local governments, from uh, national governments. And uh, anybody who gets engaged in these uh, movements um, will become uh, subject to various kinds of supervision. And the, the, the uh, German um, Agency for the Protection of the Constitution routinely blacklist any groups that are associated with uh, what's called Miligoras, which is a, a group of, um, that was not the Kemalist group, not the state-sponsored Islam in, in Turkey. Today, that divide between state-sponsored and, and, and uh, not state-sponsored Islam is, is um, not so clear anymore because the Justice and Development Party is now in, in government in Turkey and has been pushing very hard to make the two groups work together in Germany. But all of these issues um, impinge very much on the development of, of Islam. Uh, there is no clerical authority except that that is provided by the various uh, governments um, that maintain an interest in, in um, uh, development of Islam in Europe. Um, yeah. Let me just uh, briefly give you some numbers. Um, we do not really know um, much about Islam in Europe, and that's the truth, and that's why speculation can, can, uh, can develop. But uh, by one estimate, there are perhaps uh, 6,000 mosques in Western Europe. Uh, this number is based on uh, various types of um, uh, censuses done by security agencies. The French security agency was, um, did a report that was published and found out that um, there are over 1,000 imams in France. Um, about half are working full time. Only 45% are paid regularly and the rest are paid either in kind or unpaid. Of those who are paid, Turkey supports 60. Um, Turkey has government-to-government uh, government contracts for, the, um, for supporting um, Turkish-educated and funded imams in a number of uh, Western European countries and have about uh, between six and 800 imams stationed in Western Europe annually. Um, Algeria pays 80 in France and Morocco only two. The Saudi Arabian government pays for about a dozen who have graduated from Saudi Islamic universities, but actually none of them are Saudis. Those are the Wahhabis we are talking about. Less than 20% of the imams are of French nationality. Um, 
And of those who are, um, have national status, uh, they, are, they are naturalized. A very few are French born and uh, over half are 50 years old. Uh, one third speaks French with ease and another third speaks it with some difficulty and the last does not speak it at all. We could, probably, we, we, could, we could probably do a census like that in any European country and we, could, um, we would find some somewhat similar results. Now this tells you something about the challenge of developing um, a European Islam. Um, in my interviews, um, it was very apparent very early on and I spoke with parliamentarian city councillors um, regional and uh, national uh, leaders of associations that their pri that the Europe's Muslim leaders today, their primary concern is how to develop Islam in a way that's detached from the influence of the Islamic countries. Uh, it was something that came up again and again. And yes, concerns about nonsense, political nonsense being preached in the mosque was high on people's worries. Uh, if you go into mosques, the number one concern that any mosque council has is that there will be a radical identified in the myth and the security agencies will storm the mosque and will be closed down. Or alternatively, number two concern is that they will be unfairly targeted and they will still be closed down. Um, now these are, are serious issues also in a sociological sense because um, integration has an interesting way of coming in through the back door. And uh, today, uh, Muslim parents are keenly concerned about providing a model of Islam for their children that is compatible with getting an education, getting a job, and growing up. Now, I probably present a different picture to you than what you have heard before, but we know we know that um, only about perhaps 15% of Europe's Muslims are what we would call fundamentalist. This is based on very inaccurate, very difficult studies, but this is, there are three different studies that have come up with numbers in this, in, in this um, area. Now, the, everybody else is looking for a way to practice faith in a way that makes it possible to be a European. But the way that the mosque communities are organized creates a serious problem for people in their daily lives. As one association leader said to me, 80% of the imams in my mosque association are incapable of dealing with the kinds of issues that routinely come before them. Family conflicts, conflict with local governments, politicians who are saying nonsense about what goes on in the mosque. So there is a collective movement. About 15 years ago, there was a collective movement to get mosques out of the backyards. Um, it's something we can see in retrospect that in the mid-1980s, there was uh, a sense that the myth of return had come to an end and it was time to settle down roots and build proper mosques. That's when conflicts really started to emerge in Europe. Now we are in a new phase of this. Mosques have pretty much been built, uh, although there still are, for instance, in Denmark, no purpose, not a single purpose-built mosque in Denmark because local governments have consistently opposed giving permission to the construction of mosques. But the second phase really regards the education, the training, and um, the development of a presence of Islam. Uh, in, in Western Europe. The, um, there's a great deal of bootstrapping going on um, and self-regulation is taking place, which is in fact one reason why the radicals are no longer uh, meeting in mosques. The days of the Finsbury Park Mosque are over, won't happen again. And if you go to the Hofstad group, the group responsible for killing Theo van Gogh, well, they were meeting in private apartments. Today, the radicals, are recruited in prisons, in private apartments, not in mosques. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for that very enlightening <clears throat> um, presentation, which I'm sure will stir some very interesting questions. I'm going to give the uh, 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 microphone now to, or the uh, platform now, to Ambassador Mark Ginsburg. To, uh, do you have a presentation? Oh. 
Um, you all have the biographies, and I, I think, uh, Mark, you're still involved in this uh, Arab uh, broadcasting project. So, uh, Well, let me uh, first of all preface my remarks by telling this very uh, distinguished audience that I, I come at this topic from a much more practical and not an academic sense. Uh, I, uh, I'm not an academic. I have spent most of my formative years as a, uh, as a Jewish kid growing up in the Arab world, studying Islam. Almost, I'd say over 30 years of my life have spent in and out of the Arab world. And as ambassador, I decided because of the, uh, what I would call the uh, genesis of Islamic radicalism in Morocco, it became a passionate pursuit of mine to study the genesis, originations, and uh, objectives of Islamic radicalism as it started <coughs> spreading into Europe. I also head up an Arab language television production company that's producing television programming for Europe and the uh, Arab world about these issues that are not propaganda, but actually uh, commercial-style television programming. But let me look at this from the perspective as, as a Fox News commentator on Islamic issues in the Middle East and as someone who has deep and abiding admiration and respect for the Islamic faith. And I, I dare say that without a cliche that my time and tra travels in the Arab world from which I just came a few days ago remind me once again of the importance of outreach, engagement, and dialogue, and understanding, and shall we say a bit of uh, compassion and, and uh, less hubris from we Americans. But it's important for us to appreciate what is taking place in Europe. And it is not merely an academic assessment. It is also a very practical problem that is affecting a generation of young Muslims, and I, I deem it the national the, can the cancer of national identity denial. It is not uncommon for disenchantment to seize the moment and create confusion in the minds of youth. But what is most distressing is that there are two factors that are at work that are causing this cancer of national identity denial to steer young Muslims to beliefs that are inconsistent with their parents and the surroundings from which they have arisen. Two of the reasons for this, as I have come to study, particularly because of my understanding and studying of the Takfiri movement that made its way from Algeria and Morocco across into Spain and to France, as well as to Italy and Portugal and elsewhere, and I'll talk more about the Takfiri movement in a minute, is that, first and foremost, while the mosques themselves, and I'm not necessarily convinced they are, but the mosques themselves may have been purged as a result of the events of September 11th of Islamic radicalism. The periphery of the mosque remains a potent gathering place for those who are still attending the mosque but disenchanted with the message from within. And the role of the internet and the role of Islamic radical websites, coupled with the uh, spread of Islamic radical theology now and what I would call on the periphery of mosques. And when I say the periphery, it's also, as uh, my distinguished colleague said, in the, in the home, on the, perhaps in the backyards, and perhaps in high schools. One m cannot appreciate the enormous calamity of what uh, it, the internet has done to these youth without studying exactly what is being said. I spend a great deal of my time reading the Islamic radical websites that permeate not only from the Middle East but also from Europe. And I think it would come as no great surprise to many of you if I said that Ansar al-Islam, coupled with the movement that was created long before Abu Musad al-Zarqawi made his way to Iraq, was to create a very potent uh, radical Islamic network of which many young Arab youths find fascinating, intriguing, to be attracted to. Whatever may be the European government's response to the threat of Islamic radicalism in Europe, one and also coupled with the enormous importance that Muslims as well as non-Muslims give to civil liberties, the role of the internet in spreading the uh, dangerous cancer of Islamic radicalism cannot be underestimated. It is everywhere and it permeates everything on the periphery of mosques, as well as among Islamic youth. Why is this attractive to them? How do they find out about this? 
What get steers them to, the, to these websites? Well, let me try to answer some of those questions. I mentioned that Abu Masad al-Zarqawi, who was recently killed in Iraq, spent a great deal of his time and effort before he got to Iraq to develop what essentially was a network of, of Islamic radical websites, and many of those websites are being run. I almost hate to use the phrase, and I apologize and not mean to be flipped. They're the ham radio operators of Europe for the 21st century. Young Muslim webmasters uh, who are, in some respects, toyed with the idea of Islamic radicalism, but more interested in becoming the technological uh, geek squad for Islamic radical movement, uh, <laughs> spend a great deal of their time and effort getting these uh, websites into the hands uh, and to the eyeballs of young Muslims throughout Europe. And it is, um, it is a fascinating assessment when one spends just 24 hours reading what is being placed on these Arab websites and how they are being utilized from one country to the next to spread the theology of Islamic radicalism, whether, and I, again, uh, will not get into the ideological aspects. I think all of you understand what's being said. Much of this is driven not just by what I would call radical news coverage of what is taking place, but also, again, feeding off of this belief system that national identity is trumped by the importance of Islamic identity uh, in Europe. Why does this have such appeal to the youth of, of Europe? I think one need not spend a great deal of time pounding one's chest over the reasons why. A lot of it has to do with the failure of integration of European societies, the segregation of European societies, the failure to provide adequate social funding for many of the neighborhoods where many of the Muslims do live, whether it be in Spain or in, uh, in the Netherlands or in Europe, uh, in, uh, in England or in Germany. Uh, and also, a great deal of this has to do with the fact that it's taking a long time, a, taking a very long time for European governments to appreciate and understand the threat that it was in. There's many folks who study this from a political per perspective who assess that from, from American security, the greatest threat to American security is the continuing growth of Islamic radicalism in, in Europe. I'm not here to make a strong case for that. What I'm here to do is to basically focus on three things. First, the role of the Takfiri movement in Europe. Uh, the Takfiri movement is a very diabolical Trojan horse uh, movement of Islamic radicalism. The very effort is meant to integrate into Europe uh, by appearance and by practice through petty crime, etc., Islamic radicals who are able to, in effect, avoid being uh, identified by European authorities uh, and ingratiating themselves and integrating themselves as much as possible by appearance into the societies from which they are. We have assessed, in my contacts with in European intelligence agencies, particularly with the French Counterterrorism Intelligence Service, that the Takfiris themselves were largely responsible for making sure that the young Muslims in England were getting access to many of these websites and spreading some of the information from uh, community to community without it being identified or them being identified. And many of them are using and have married European spouses uh, to, to uh, carry on this exercise. Why and how does this Takfiri movement generate its direction and command and control structure is something that is still very hard to uncover, but it is there, and I just wanted to make sure that people appreciated it. The second is the fact that while European societies, and particularly, uh, and I'll just try to use this illustration, the British authorities, finally after 15 years shut down the Finsbury Park Mosque, let me remind you that uh, London was the first host uh, city to host an Al-Qaeda office uh, in Europe. And it's taken the British authorities an enormous amount of time and effort to come to grips with the spread of Islamic radicalism in their midst. Now they understand it, unfortunately as a result more of the London bombings than anything else. But there's no doubt that while most of the Islamic terrorists that are going to Iraq at this point in time derive themselves from countries from Morocco to Saudi Arabia, 
uh, Syria, uh, Egypt, etc., that not all of them are going to Iraq in order to stay in Iraq. Okay? We have been able to trace that for, all, for every 10 Islamic terrorists who go to train and then participate in the insurgency movement in Iraq, at least one, if not two of them, are then dispatched to leave for places unknown. Okay? We do not know where they're going. We know of one thing, that the Syrian government is facilitating to a large extent through the Hezbollah, uh, this mo outbound movement of terrorists in and out of Iraq. Now, I say this as someone who has not doing this based on just ra you know, uh, wild accusation, but on a continuing assessment, not only by European intelligence services, but also by Arab intelligence services, particularly the Jordanian intelligence service, as to what is taking place. It is not meant to provoke uh, resentment, it is meant merely to make a statement about what is taking place there. Finally, um, let me make a comment about the youth, the Islamic youth that I have spent time with, both in Morocco as well as in Europe that I have met with and in my interviews for the book that I hope to have out shortly. Many of them say to me in my interviews with them that what is most attracting them to their lost identity is their sense of lack of identity for themselves and for their sense of who they are and what they can do in their lives in the future in their countries. I think it is a cliche almost to say that the vast majority of Islamic youth in Europe are un unemployed if not underemployed. They're untrained and not able to have the same access to jobs uh, that many of their counterparts uh, in their societies do and just look at the events in Spain, I'm sorry, in France, the riots that preceded uh, recent events in, in Canada and elsewhere, uh, to let everyone understand that the same problems that exist for Islamic youth in Morocco exist for Islamic youth in Europe. The fact is, is that under the circumstances, there's far more resources, greater resources available uh, in Europe to help deal with the problem of integration than there are in Morocco or in Spain, I'm sorry, or in Algeria or Libya or Egypt. And finally, in, in, in conclusion, in order to give more opportunity for questions and answers, I, I would like to uh, say that those youth with whom I talk to uh, understand that their parents uh, who made it as a first generation as a Muslim immigrant to Europe feel a deep sense of of abiding faith and confidence in what their parents have taught them, but who lack a sense of direction in their lives and seek adventure. And these websites, again going back to the websites, offer them a sense of opportunity and adventure that is missing in their own lives. I'm not apologetic for it. I'm merely saying to you that in order for us, you to begin thinking about suffocating the ideological underpinning of Islamic radicalism among youth in Europe, one cannot ignore how the internet is playing a crucial role in this process. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And um, since, as I said, I know the non-Muslims the, non in the audience have uh, been deluged with uh, what must be in some respects a rather strange vocabulary. I'm going to let Mark, would you give a very one-line definition of talk theory? Well, uh, the, the, uh, I'll give you the, the, what I consider the practical definition of takfir. It comes from, the takfiris are actually an off, offshoot of the, the Salafia movement. And the takfiri, uh, uh, the takfiri belief is essentially even more diabolical than anything written by Al-Qaeda. Because what essentially takfiri promote is the uh, belief system of promoting a true Islamic identity even if it means perishing less Islamic believers in your midst. Yeah. Okay, right. that's good. And now, um, uh, one of the things that I think is a great landmark about this conference is I think anybody who attends this conference will walk away and they can say that uh, it was a conference that uh, didn't just talk about Europe as Western Europe, and uh, we made a point of having the Slovene participation and Jim Lyon, and now I'm going to hand over the platform to Mirza Effendi Amasic, who is a uh, 
imam in the distinguished uh, mosque of Zagreb, Croatia. It's my turn. Yes. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu, or peace be upon you. Uh, dear sisters and brothers, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is uh, Mirza Mesh, only Mirza Mesh Efendia, minus in Turkey, Mr. Efendia is nothing. <laughs> Please. <laughs> I'm Imam and uh, I work as professor uh, in elementary school in Madrasa and Islamic Center in Zagreb. Uh, in the beginning, uh, I want to thanks Mr. Sh thank Mr. Schwartz and Mr. Andy Peros. Miss Peros, yes. Miss, right yes. Okay. And uh, Woodrow Wilson Institution that uh, they invited me to attend this very important conference. I want also to apologize because my English uh, is so no good, uh, and but I hope that you will be able to understand me. Inshallah. If you if you have if you will have any questions, uh, Mr. Schwartz uh, will answer instead of me. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, he invited me, I uh, uh, had proposal that uh, I only be a visitor, only to watch and to learn because uh, it's my first visit. Uh, to United States of America, really it's my first time that I have to speak in English in front of audience. I have a bit of jitters, but uh, uh, I hope that you, have, uh, you will have understanding for me. Okay. Uh, I come from Croatia. Croatia is one of one typical uh, Christian or Catholic country. Population is uh, 4.5 million people. Uh, in Croatia, I live about 100 Muslims, but uh, uh, Muslims are uh, very well integrated in Croatian society. There is no any barrier because we have the uh, same language. Uh, uh, we Muslims are genuine Muslims, so we are not immigrants. And uh, uh, what I have to, to note uh, this occasion, uh, uh, yes, th this, that uh, Croatia as state recognized Islam as a religion. Only four, only four states in Europe recognized Islam as a religion. 1960, it was uh, 1912, pardon, it was Austria. Na 1960, it was Croatia, and 1992, Belgium and Spain. No more states recognized Islam as as a religion. Uh, I want to say that Muslims are very well integrated. Uh, uh, we have a contract uh, uh, between uh, government. Croatian government and Islamic community. Uh, we have a right to organize uh, our schools. We have, I, as imam, um, have right to go to prison to, to, to visit some prisoners who are Muslims, uh, to, to go to hospital freely. Uh, to, to, uh, we have organized, you know, teaching uh, our, our, our children in, in public schools. Uh, we, fortunately, have no any problems in Croatia. Uh, it was during the war, you know, uh, 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 I was born in Bosnia, uh, unfortunately in Bosnia live genuine Muslim. Uh, uh, I want to say that uh, uh, that Muslim Muslims can be example for, for my brothers and sisters in Europe. It's a real example how uh, they, they, they love uh, their, their Islam, their, their religion, but unfortunately in uh, 1992 or 1995, uh, you know about that, uh, only one day uh, in Srebrenica, 10,000 men were killed because only one reason, they were Muslims. Uh, I hope that it will ever, never happen again. And the eyes of that people, you know, uh, they watch in <laughs> United States of America, or government in United States of America, and they uh, expect that to be protected uh, in future, inshallah, because it was 10th genocide against Muslim, uh, who are genuine Muslim, who are not immigrants. Indigenous. Indigenous. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I have in front of me uh, what we name Declaration of European Muslims, which is author uh, Professor Dr. Mustafa Fendi Tseric. Somebody mentioned him. Professor Dr. Mustafa Tseric, Declaration of European Muslims, uh, this declaration has three parts. I need 15 minutes, please. You have it. 
Uh, starting now. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm going to read uh, now that expressing the sense of uh, the European Muslims regarding the attack in New York in September 2001 and the massacre in Madrid in March 2004 and the bomb explosion in London in July 2005. Whereas on 11th September, two, uh, whereas following the New York attack, the Madrid massacre and the London bombing the European Muslims live under the heavy pressure of collective guilt for Islamic terrorism, which is constantly being propagated by some politicians and media. Whereas the European Muslims believe that there is no collective guilty, but an individual responsibility. Whereas the European Muslims suffer from Islamophobia due to an irresponsible coverage of the Muslim issues in Europe by some media. Whereas the European Muslims love freedom for others as they love it for themselves and appreciate citizenship and human rights in multicultural societies. Whereas the European Muslims would like to raise their children, I have two sons, in peace and security with other religious communities in Europe on the basis of ethics of sharing. Whereas Islam teaches Muslims that Jews and Christians are the people of the book, and so all the Jews, Christians, and Muslims should learn how to share their common spiritual roots and their common futuristic hopes without prejudice in order to avoid discrimination, low self-esteem, demoralization, religious and racial hatred, helplessness, lack of control, social avoidance, lack of opportunities, etc. Whereas Europe is a common continent of many faiths, Whereas Europa is proud of its road from slavery to freedom, from mythology to science, from might to right, and from the theory of state to legitimacy of states, as well as Europa's commitment to the basic values of human rights and democracy. Whereas the European Muslims want to be part of a European life and prosperity, as well as a social, political, cultural, and the moral development of European societies. Now there be it declared first to the European Union that it is the sense of European Muslims that Europe is the house of peace and security based on the principle of, of, of social contract. The land of Europe is the house of social contract because it is possible to live in accordance with one's faith in the context of the principles that free and rational persons considered to father their own interest would accept an, in an initial position of equality as defining the fundamental terms of their association. The European Muslims are fully and committed to the following European uh, common values, which are Islamic values also. The, the, the rule, rule of law, the principles of tolerance, the values of democracy and human rights, and to the belief that each and every human being has a right to five essential values. The value of life, the value of faith, the value of freedom, the value of property, and the value of dignity. The fifth, as they try to live decent life in Europe, the European Muslims have the following expecta expectations. The institutionalization of Islam in Europe, it is very important, institutionalization of Islam in Europe. The economic development of the Muslim community so that it may have a full spiritual and cultural freedom and independence. The development of the Islamic schools capable to educate European-born Muslims for new challenges of the multicultural societies. The political freedom that will enable European Muslims to have their le legitimate re representatives in the European state parliaments. The relaxation of the European migration policy, which tends to be very restrictive towards Muslims recently. Recently or recently? Recently. recently. Opening the way for the Muslim law to be recognized in matters of personal status, status such as the family law, and to protection of European Muslims from Islamophobia, ethnics, cleansing, genocide, and like. The European Muslims are committed to a co comprehensive joint program for a religious dialogue that will build awareness of the 
complexities of the secular context in which religions exist today, promote understanding, respect differences, and explore common ground, affirm, affirm religious identities as important instruments to deal with insecurity and conflict, and to learn to respect and uh, live with diversity in situation on, of conflict, contribute to ongoing discourse on human rights, create an understanding of the otherness of the other person, show of the complex relationship between religion, culture, politics, and economics, and to highlight the factors which lead towards positive contribution by religions to common efforts for truth, justice, and peace. Identify religious principles, moral and ethical values, and norms that are comparable and that can be negotiated for a life together, and those that are distinct to each faith and to recognize possible differences, tensions, and misunderstanding between particular moral and ethical values in different religions. Second, to the Muslim who live in Europe, that it is the sense of the European Muslim that the Muslims who live in Europe should realize that freedom is not a gift given by anyone. The Muslim freedom in Europe must be earned and the Muslim status must be recognized in spite of xenophobic opposition. The Muslims who live in Europe should be more concerned now about their responsibilities than about their freedoms, because by assuming their responsibility in the European economical, political, and cultural life, the Muslims who live in Europe will earn their right to freedom. Hence, the freedom of the European Muslims will not be somebody, somebody's mercy, but a possessed value which can neither be denied nor taken away. Muslims who live in Europe should present Islam to the Western audience as a universal Weltanschauung, it's a German word, Weltanschauung. Weltanschauung. and not as a tribal, ethnical, or national culture. What mentioned Professor Cesare, the Muslims cannot expect from the Europeans to appreciate the universal message of Islam if they are constantly faced with the ethnical or national color of Islam. It is not only that the European Muslim can impress the European public by universalism of Islam, but also Europe is a good place for the Muslims themselves to discover the power and the beauty of the universality of Islam. It is in the West that many Muslims discover Islam in a totally different way from their homeland because here they meet their fellow Muslims from other parts of the Muslim world and thus begin to appreciate the diversity of Islamic experience and culture. The Muslims who live in Europe have the right, nay the duty to develop their own European culture of Islam as a proof of the third interaction between the East and the West and as a need for a new renaissance that will lead the humanity to a better and safer world. The young generation of Muslims who live in Europe should be spiritually strong and intellectually bold to break the Muslims' own stereotypes about Islam before asking others to change their stereotypes. Muslim youth must take the lead into their future, not to wait for the elders to do their job. The Muslim youth should not be shy to take the lead into a better future of the Muslims who live in Europe. The Muslims who live in Europe should commit themselves to the following imperatives of their faith, Islam. R read and learn, believe and work hard, be pious and respect your parents, be honest and fight for your rights, and be aware of tomorrow. And finally, the third to the Muslim world that it is the sense of European Muslims that the, Mus the Muslim world is a universal community of Muslims who are brothers by their common faith in one God and in the pro prophethood of Muhammad, peace be upon him. It is because of the, uh, the idea, pardon, uh, the idea of global awareness shouldn't be a strange thing to Muslim in its essence. Islam is a universal faith and a global phenomenon. It would have been fully appropriate if the Muslims had come with an agenda of a globalization in terms of a global freedom and security because Muslims are scattered almost everywhere on the globe and so their freedom and security are of a global importance. It is not only that Muslims have failed to come with a genuine idea of globalization 
but they are, generally speaking, failing now to live a global world. Muslims have no global strategy. They have no, unfortunately, global mind and head. They have no global calendar to save them from the embarrassment of the confusion about the date of Eid al-Adha, unfortunately. They have the image of the, uh, threatening freedom and security of the world. They have a stigma of global terrorism. It is because of the stigma of Islamic terrorism from which Muslims are unjustly suffering today that a declaration of the European Muslims to the Muslim world should be worked out in order to emphasize the importance of a change from a bad global image to a good global image of Muslims, especially in matters of their <coughs> faith. The center of Islam should take the lead in providing global guardians in practical matters of our universal faith in global shoes of our time in, and in global dialogue with our, with our neighborhoods. The Muslims, wherever they may be, should prove to the whole world that Islam, Islam is both sincere faith and rightful religion, that it is both attractive culture and peaceful politics, that it is both good people and rich land, and that Islam is both the wise man of the East and the rational man of the West. It is wrong to accuse Islam for the lack of democracy in the Muslim world. It is sin to violate human rights in the name of Islam. It is crime against Islam to tolerate a high rate of illiteracy in the Muslim world and to witness a huge gap between enormously rich and the extremely poor people in the Muslim world. The European Muslims have the right and the duty to raise these and other issues which have an impact on the future of their children as they are trying to figure out who they are and what they are supposed to do as Muslims in a European in, 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 Yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> the European Muslims call for a global Muslim community to take to lead in promoting the peace and security in the world. The Muslim world is a legitimate ummah that should be capable to carry out the duty of a morally good, rationally balanced, economically just and globally proactive community which is uh, trustworthy of partnership and friendship everywhere. We all take, and finally, we all take different path in life, but no matter where we go, we take a little of each other everywhere. Friends are God's way of care of us. God bless you. I think, uh, I don't think there's anybody in the audience who didn't understand uh, Mirza, but if uh, there's anybody who did, they can uh, question him afterwards. We're going to run until about 12.10 uh, for uh, questions. Um, so um, I'm going to ask people to make questions brief and uh, identify themselves uh, when they um, ask their questions. And um, I'm also going to ask the uh, respondents to be brief because at 12.10 uh, we're all supposed to go eat a terrific lunch. Uh, sir, right there. Uh, Will Amatruda, Catholic University. Uh, this question is, is for Dr. Clausen. Uh, you mentioned that there are approximately 6,000 mosques in Western Europe. Uh, are there any Islamic seminaries in, in Europe? Uh, and I'm motivated to ask by the, the excellent piece that appeared at the New York Times Sunday about the movement to establish an Islamic uh, seminary here in the United States. Do you want me to answer right away, or do you want to click Yeah, please, questions? go ahead okay. and answer. Um, well, <laughs> The University of Amsterdam started a program uh, a year ago that's a four-year program to educate people in Islamic chaplaincy, and they took in 20 students. Um, in Britain, there are a couple of uh, 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 schools that have uh, established degree programs in collaboration with local universities. One is the Islamic Foundation that's working with Loughborough University. Another one is uh, the Muslim College, which is working with Birkbeck College. Um, the issue is that all of these programs are educating people who expect regular salaries which no real mosque can uh, afford to pay. So the graduates from these programs tend to get jobs in prison services, hospitals, or in universities and colleges and social services. 
Um, there are various types of, uh, there are, for instance, we, now we talked about the Deobandis before, there are about 25 Deobandi seminaries in Britain. Um, and they teach according to a syllabus that is uh, completely moved. It's in Urdu, it's moved, lock, stock, and barrel. It's like McDonald's, it's the same product wherever you go. And most of, uh, of their uh, graduates actually don't even get jobs in Britain either, they move elsewhere. Um, one of the core problems is that we, we estimate about less than 5% of the current, um, uh, some 10,000 imams in Western Europe actually have um, an education from a European university. And when they do, they are often autodidacts, they're people who are part-timers. So the question is, who among these people should we really be concerned about? Well, the numbers I showed you, that, well, they're about, the Wahhabis have, uh, are paying uh, 20 out of 1,000 imams in, 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 uh, in France. And that's probably a pretty good estimate of what the Wahhabi influence is. But then there are autodidacts and there are religious entrepreneurs. And if you are need to be worried about anybody, it's the religious entrepreneurs, the people who set up the mosque to live out of it. And actually, that accounts for the, the person, the, the um, Abu Laban, the Danish imam who shipped the cartoons around uh, to the Islamic countries. Actually, he couldn't go himself because he was a, uh, a political refugee from the Emirates and were not allowed to travel to Cairo. So he had to put the traveling show together and have some other young imams travel for him. But he actually is a religious entrepreneur. He lives out of the mosque. And when I visited him, um, I asked how he knew how to satisfy his, the needs of his flock. And he pulled out a stack of, of surveys he had distributed during the month of Ramadan, asking uh, what was expected of him. Should, uh, should the imam go on TV and talk about politics? Yes, yes, yes. 85% said he should. Uh, uh, so the, it, the, there's a lot of issues about this whole questions about education. And I think the primary issue that we need to be aware of is that the lack of an education or a lack of a, of, of a presence for Muslims within the theological faculties, where typically Islam today is taught by a Christian clergy, the, that problem creates a real serious obstacle to interreligious dialogue and to the, to the development of an educated and articulate presence of Islam in Europe. I just wanted to add, uh, we have some very good <coughs> seminaries in the Balkans, especially in Sarajevo. And the Center for Islamic Pluralism is working with the uh, uh, Institute for Islamic Studies in Sarajevo to develop a curriculum and uh, some very exciting new ideas that I won't bother to go into. Uh, let's see, next person, Ali. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to ask uh, Dr. Chassari first. Uh, my question is about the Mark Gainsbourg. Wait, wait, wait. I can't hear you. <coughs> Thank you. Could you evaluate the number, proportion of this takfir movement in Europe? You mentioned its increasing role. Do you have any statistics or data? What do they represent? How much of the youth of Europe do they represent? This is my question. And just a short commentary on your reason of this influence related to socioeconomic failure. I would say that even tomorrow in the best world possible, if we get rid of and employment and socioeconomic marginality, I'm not convinced that we're going to get rid of this influence of uh, Islam as an ideology as you describe. And there is here, and we have evidence that people from middle class are more inclined to get in the leadership of this movement than the poor disenfranchised young men of the banlieue. Um, so there is, uh, my, it's just an addition to what you are saying. I'm not saying that people are not getting into this movement for social frustration, but there are other reasons related to the symbolic status of this class or group in European society that is not even addressed today in Europe. Well, let me just say, I agree with you, and I do not want to leave the impression that there's one answer and one solution, and, and if you just you know, flipped the switch, eliminated uh, so lower social class poverty, that, every, that Islamic radicalism uh, would disappear as a attractive theology for the youth. Uh, I'm going to go back and, uh, and, and, give, and, and give you my assessment. From the time I was, during the time I was ambassador, uh, from 94 to 98, and then from 98 until 2003, there was an estimated 7,500 hardcore takfiris that we estimated had managed to 
um, uh, abscond their way across the Straits into Europe. Uh, some of them had made it legally, but most had made it illegally, uh, from, particularly from Algeria, uh, as well as from Morocco. Uh, now, how many of those 7,500 have now proliferated into 9,000 or 10,000? I don't know the answer to that. Relatively speaking, the number may seem insignificant. Uh, relatively speaking to my understanding of uh, the Takfiri objectives, it's a major number to contend with. And I want to point out to you that the leadership of the Madrid bombings were all Takfiri. Okay? Number two, uh, just to finish the comment, I, uh, I have tried not to get myself into a position of cliching the threat and source and solution of Islamic radicalism. Uh, one can make, and, and, and commentators on TV try to make the very uh, simplistic argument that uh, there are theological as well as social uh, cannon fodder uh, for Islamic radicalism, and that the sociological economic uh, the economic cannon fodder, as we say, for Islamic radicalism would perhaps be less of a problem if there was more opportunity for these youth. That doesn't mean to say, doesn't mean to say that the issue of identity, of national identity, is resolved through the stratification uh, and bootstrapping of Islamic youth in Europe. So I, I agree with you. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm going to uh, take a question from Ali. And then uh, Dr. Risman, and uh, then uh, Sheikh Al. Oh, we have uh, also. Uh, uh, we're going to give first priority to some of our guests, but we'll finish by 12:15. Uh, so first Ali, and then Risman, and then Anjal, and then uh, Al Alawi. Ali Al Ahmed from the Gulf Institute. Uh, my question is very quick. Uh, I wanted to address the. I want you to address the issue of the fact that the European social system has enabled many of these uh, extremists to live and have housing, free housing, while they can do their work, like Abu Hamza and others, were actually living and paid for by the British government, and similarly in, in France and other countries. They were, they were not working, as one of you said, that they don't like to work, and they just sit around and have babies and do their work. And uh, is, is in a way that we, uh, somehow the European social system, uh, uh, welfare system can be reformed in order to give only those people who are in need, not those people who live off the infidels and while f trying to uh, murder them at the same time. Who is that addressed to, Ali? I'll take care of it. Okay. I mean, if we start saying that there should be political criteria for giving social services, there would be an awful lot of people living on the streets in Europe, certainly, right? Um, about Abu Hamza, um, there was a concrete reason that Abu Hamza was uh, removed from the Finsbury Park Mosque, uh, and that was that the, uh, the police and uh, MI5 agreed that he should stay where he was. Uh, five year, uh, two, he, he took over, he hijacked the mosque. There was a complaint made from the mosque council against him two years before uh, the mosque was stormed and he was physically removed from the mosque. Uh, there's an organization called the Charities Commission that oversees mosques. The Charities Commission uh, was told to sit on the file until the, social, until the security services decided to arrest him. This has become a big issue uh, subsequently because during Abu Hamza's trial it became clear that he had engaged in, a very, in all sorts of talk. Uh, he was a basic thug. Um, he he pay, asked for protection money from people, and there were people who would be made to go away, et cetera. And, and that was clear to many of the people in the Finsbury Park community uh, who he had intimidated and threatened. Uh, but this was, a, this was a decision made at the highest level of government not to route him up, out earlier. Okay, I'm going to uh, recognize Dr. Rissman from Slovenia. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Dennis Rissman, Center for European Perspective. Um, thank you for all of you about this insightful um, Muslim affair point of view. Um, one reply to Abu Hamza, um, just before I start. Well, the main reason why he was not deported or moved away was because the United Kingdom government could not find the reason how to deport him. And that's but the they could put him in prison. They had plenty no, of evidence no, to put him in prison. No, that was the main reason why they couldn't. And um, I, I lived in the United Kingdom for four years, and I think um, people here would agree with me. There was a big contentious issue how to deport it. Um, secondly, um, 
I cannot think but to say on this declaration of uh, Imam Tzerich, which is excellent, uh, that if Muslim and non-Muslims would live by what he actually written inside, um, we would not have any problems today. However, that's not the case. And um, what I would like to ask to all, to address to all three of you is what practical steps actually need to be taken within Muslim communities and EU policymakers to consolidate the position of Islam within the European Union? Because currently there are many different aspects of Muslim communities, of Muslim ideas, how the Islam, what kind of path or the way of Islam should actually be in the European Union. Okay, I'm going to ask, since we're getting late, I'm going to ask each of the three panelists to reply with one or two sentences as to the recommendations. I know that's asking for just to read the cover of the phone book, but we will take up these issues after lunch as well. So if each of you could give one or two uh, quick uh, statements on things that need to be done in Europe. Starting with you, Mark. I was almost going to answer by saying I don't know. Okay. okay. Because, but let me just at least try to save myself <laughs> by, by making one particular recommendation. Uh, the very point that the religion is so dispersed and so uncentralized cries out for at least there to be something that I would call, in, in, euphemistically, a conference of imams, of European imams, who essentially are able to spend a great deal of time collectively trying to deal with these issues. Uh, I think that is confidence is a magical word, <laughs> confidence. We need confidence and uh, uh, true uh, constant education. Uh, <clears throat> somebody mentioned to me that uh, we organize uh, th uh, these debates uh, constantly, but when we uh, go back to, to uh, 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 our, our homes, uh, we uh, continue to speak we and and uh, they no uh, we must be we you know because uh, it's problem and problem uh, for European Muslims uh, it's my opinion that uh, some negative uh, some situation in uh, Islamic world uh, uh, have impact on situation or position of, of Muslim in 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 Europe you have uh, take examples. Uh, uh, 90, uh, 1999, uh, Iranian Islamic Revolution. You have, you you can take example uh, affair of Salman Rushdie. You take, you, you can take example madness of Taliban and uh, uh, Israel Palestinian conflict. Uh, I think that unfortunately, uh, it has uh, a very impact uh, on this position and situation uh, Muslims in Europe. Angel from uh, Rand. Uh, and uh, since this is a panel that has to do with ideology and theology, uh, I would like the opinion of uh, the, the panelists, uh, whoever would like to answer, on why uh, so little has been done, uh, at least in the Western European context, to combat the ideological sources of, uh, of extremism and, and, and terrorism in Europe. That, as uh, uh, Daniel Pipes asked and earlier in the previous panel, do governments, such as the British government in particular, but others as well, uh, seem to take the view that anyone who is not a terrorist is therefore a, a moderate Muslim? And uh, could you please? Uh, Let me take a quick stab at it because it's dear to my heart as a question. I, I lecture all over the world on Said Qutb, and when I bring uh, Said Qutb's. Uh, uh, what I'd call what is probably the most magnificent piece of prison literature ever written uh, in the shade of the Quran. Uh, to people, to Western eyes and ears, most have never heard. I always say, you've heard of Mein Kampf and you've heard of Karl Marx, but how many of you have heard of Said Qutab? Most of his works, for example, just are not taught or even translated. Uh, in the shade of the Quran has not been completely translated and annotated. How are we ever going to get, win the battle of ideas if we don't understand the enemy and what the enemy has written? And I couldn't agree more. Yuta. The answer to, the, uh, to Dr. Pipe's question is yes. In Britain, it is now official policy that everybody is a moderate unless they are violent extremists. Um, 
and that, that is what came out of Charles Clark's uh, Rethink and Working Party Strategy um, last, uh, last fall. I've written a report about it that's going to be published by the uh, U.S. Institute of Peace. It will be up next week about uh, the British government's new counterterrorism strategy, faith-based counterterrorism, which means basically having... Uh, relying on Salafists uh, to convert the bad dudes into peaceful Salafism. <laughs> uh, don't have any comments. I do want to make one brief comment. You know, we Muslims don't like the use of this term Salafi to refer to the Wahhabis. Salafi refers to the first two generations after the Prophet. And to let them use that name, it also refers to a reform movement in the 19th century, to let them use that name is, would be as if we were to call neo-Nazis authentic American patriots, or as when it happened in the past when communists said, oh, we're just liberals. They are Wahhabis. Everybody in the Muslim world knows that. I'm going to cut off now. I was going to let Sheikh al Alawi ask a question, but I know we're one minute away from lunch, and Sheikh will have his uh, time again after lunch. I want to thank everybody for coming, and I want to thank everybody for participating. Thank you.